In order to provide a great customer experience and let design deliver on its value in a systemic, structured and ongoing way, you need to rewire the neural pathways inside your organization. Say what? So now next to being a service design professional, you also need to become a brain surgeon? Let's find out. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Kia ora. My name is Perrin Roland, and this is The Service Design Show, episode 184. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine, and welcome back to The Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make all the difference between success and failure? all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Perrin Rollen. Perrin is the Chief Experience Design Officer at Westpac, which is one of the largest banks in New Zealand. According to Perrin, there are some really interesting parallels that can be drawn between how our brains work and how the organizations work that we serve every day. We have certain beliefs, routines, behaviors, and ways of doing things. All these things have been programmed into us by the things we experience in the outside world. Now, our organizations also have beliefs, routines, behaviors, and the way they do things. Now, if you and I want to change our behavior, Let's say we want to get rid of our deep fear for spiders. We need to change the associations that our brain makes when we see that spider. We need to rewire our neural pathways for that our brain associates a spider with something like curiosity rather than fear. If you hadn't figured it out already, rewiring the neural pathways and performing brain surgery inside your organization isn't an easy task or for the faint of heart. But when done right, the result can be transformational and will allow your organization to live on into the future. Okay, if all this sounds a bit conceptual, stick with us because I promise you things will get much more practical as we go along. Because at the end of this conversation, you'll know exactly what the neural pathways are that you need to rewire in order for your organization to put customers at the heart of what they do rather than internal processes or shareholders value. How do you pull off this form of brain surgery without having any prior experience or the right tools? And what's the best place to start when you decide to embark on this ambitious journey. Okay, buckle up and get ready because this promises to be a hack of a ride. Welcome to the show, Perrin. Hi, Mark. All the way from Auckland, New Zealand, right? Yes, you are in the home of Beach Haven where there ain't no beach and there ain't no haven, but we love it anyway. <laughs> That's such a good tagline. I need a similar one as well. Uh, it's uh, early morning for you and it's late evening for me. Uh, I think we are really 12 hours apart or something like that. So if a this, in yeah, if this interv in interview sounds a bit uncohesive, uh, it's either you or me or it's both of us the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, due to the uh, uh, recording time. So we're, let's prepare the audience. Um, Baron, um, could you give us uh, an... A brief overview of uh, what you do these days. What's your role? Um, how did you get there? Uh, we'd like to know more. Sure. So um, I like to say that, um, so I moved to New Zealand. This is a long story, so everyone should just buckle up. Um, when I moved to New Zealand in 2005, I came in as like a bright-eyed UX designer, interaction designer, information designer. And I, I came to do some schooling and I thought I'd get a part-time job and everyone's like, oh, you're a graphic designer. I'm like, oh, no, I can't make anything beautiful. I just make things make sense. Um, and they're like, well, we don't need that. And I said, OK, that's fair. So I ended up working with a um, learning management system 
um, helping them teach people to use the software. Um, so it was an online learning system and they hired trainers to sit with academics and basically show them how to use the system. And I was like, you know, if you use someone like myself in a different capacity, we could actually make this self-serve and you don't need to hire trainers. And they were like, that's ridiculous. All software needs a human manual. And I'm like, thank you for your time. Um, anyway, 10 years later, finally, I end up at a UX conference and I'm like, where have you all been? I've been here forever. <laughs> what is going on? Um, and so then I ended up um, in the health field for ages, which was which was so much fun, figuring out ways to help doctors and nurses um, work smarter, not harder, using making technology relate and information relatable, which is, I think, the core of what design does. Right. We make things we humanize things. We make things relatable. So fast forward via various career progressions, um, you know, I found that my calling was was much more service design and design leadership. And so now I'm really, really lucky to be the chief experience design officer for Westpac New Zealand, which is one of the four main banks here in um, New Zealand. And I, I think of my job as humanizing commerce and providing the strategies, frameworks, and patterns that allow designers to work within an enterprise design system to actually ensure that we, we can make sure that every single touch point that the bank has, our customers feel like they have a partner in the, in the, of the power of the bank behind them. So every moment our customers are interacting with us, the whole bank is working to help them get their job done. Mm. That's what I do. You've got such a good pitch. Uh, luckily, we're <laughs> re recording this, so you can just forward uh, the podcast or the video to anyone who wants to know what you're up to. This is so good. <laughs> I can do interviews. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for that Listen. intro. Yeah, but that's not uh, that's not enough because we have a lightning fire question round. I've got five questions for you to get to know you a bit better as a person next to the professional. I haven't prepared you for what's coming. Okay. Um, just the first thing that comes to your mind and we won't go any deeper into them. Are you ready? All right. But I have no, okay, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> if you could work from anywhere in the world, which place would you pick? Oh. I would be with my absolute best friend in Queens, New York, um, sitting on her couch, working from there. Mm -hmm. awesome. I'd, I'd have to put my family in the apartment above us so they don't feel left out. But that's that's where I would be. Queens, New York. Got it. Noted. Um, this is also becoming a fan favorite question. What is your go to karaoke song? All right. So there's I can tell you what my go to karaoke song karaoke songs aren't so nothing by mariah carey because you're never going to hit those notes um nothing by um uh, celine dion again for the same reason tequila is a good one because all you have to do is go tequila so yeah i'll go with tequila note i can carry a tune so i like the spoken verse song mm. and also i can Next time, next time we meet, <laughs> I'll I'll set that as my ringtone uh, for the times that people call each other, which they never do anymore. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, next question is: What did you want to become when you were a kid? A roller skating waitress. Awesome. Yes. Is that, that, was is that still your ambition? Well, I my parents call me Grace, not out of support, but in irony and mocking. So the idea of moving around on wheels is truly aspirational. And I've, I've been, a, I don't think anybody should be an adult without learning service. Uh, to be quite serious, I found that grow, I grew up, um, you know, waitressing, and then I actually spent a really large amount of my time chefing. So um, right after the towers fell in New York City, I kind of had a bit of a midlife crisis. I boyfriend broke up with me. Um, you know, sad. Um, and everything seemed to just, and the dot com bubble was happening. And so I decided to move to Italy and become a chef. Um, and I lived in Italy uh, uh, mostly legally for about two, two years and uh, worked, you know, in stages. So I would work for room and board in all these restaurants. And so learning, I thought that was some of the best UX training I ever had. Because when you think about creating a mise en place, which is everything you need in order to create a it's it's there's a lot of trope there that lines up to design and design thinking and service design but i also think just to be a better human you should 
are what it means to serve and how to treat people. I couldn't agree more. I think I did a recent webinar where somebody asked me, like, give, what's your piece of advice for aspiring service designers? And I said, go get a job in a restaurant or a hotel. Uh, or a bar even. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Question number four. This is becoming a, 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 an like expen <laughs> expanded <laughs> lightning round. Sorry. What is your <laughs> hidden talent? Well, I, I busted it with, with cooking. So there's that. Um, I am, I give really, really great advice. I, I'm like a hidden Yenta. I can't take it, but I mean, who can take their own advice? But I am like, you want to know how to do something? I got you. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. I'll add you to my notebook for uh, uh, questions about anything. You're like a walking G <laughs> chat GPT. Um, I know, okay. <laughs> chat GPT, but with less facts. Mm, uh, more, more flavor. More uh, records. <laughs> uh, we've arrived at question number five, uh, the last one, which is a tradition uh, here. And that is, do you recall the first moment you heard about service design? You know, I remember the first time I learned about information architecture that's burned into my brain, but I, I, I don't, I can't, I can't even make up a good story about this. I feel like, I feel like service design was the, the maturity of my pathway. And so it wasn't a, a moment, but a emergence. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> Sorry, I, I can't even make up a good story. <laughs> oh, we'll edit one uh, in post-production, no worries. Um, all right. <laughs> Thanks, Perrin. Uh, this was a really nice start to the interview and you actually gave me a great leeway into the topic of today. You mentioned it was your pathway uh, sort of to uh, find service design. And uh, continuing on the topic of pathways, you suggested that we talk about uh, building new or, or organizational neuro pathways. Like mm. what the uh, elite the is that? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on one second. So I, there's this great book. Oh, we can't see it because I blurred it right there. Live uh, Wired. Live, live Wired by David Eagleman. And it's the inside story of the ever-changing brain. I have a lot of books. But, and I've read all the ones that I buy, the Kindle ones, maybe not so much, but, um, and what he talks about in this book is he really, he tackles neuroplasticity. And what he says is like, plastic's actually really hard. What we, what we think about having to do is rewire the way that our circuits move throughout our brain so that we become life, you know, we're lifelong learners. We're constantly adapting and changing. Um, and it, there's, you know, there's a method and message in there about you know, growth mindsets and keeping your brain going. Organizations um, have the same, same, um, I found a, an alignment to organizational design as well. And thinking about, you know, what, what culture does is it's the sort of set pathways about how you do things. And then change is constantly about rewiring. And so when we think about you know, visible and invisible experienced pathways that I think service design spends a lot of time thinking about. If you want a, an organization to serve customer need, and if you're working in an enterprise organization like I am, we have to rewire the organization quite deliberately in order to make that a systematized approach and a serviced approach. And so there's there's lots of of alignment that I think about when we think about rewiring and creating pathways that have to become habitual and and patterned and it's uh it's and it's hard and stupid and requires a lot of resilience <laughs> like, which is I think you know like anytime you learn a new habit like you know people tell me quitting smoking is hard and stupid and requires a lot of resilience <laughs> an organization the way it acts is so you're saying it maybe resembles uh, how the brain works and we need to re rewire it, the organization, in order to serve our customers. Now, uh, one could ask the question here, what do you mean, uh, Perrin? Because they've been serving their customers for 
the day since they started. So why do we need to change the pathways? So enterprise organizations, which is organizations that um, have existed for a really long time, they've already scaled, they're really large, or maybe they're foundational institutions. So uh, working for a bank, right? Our bank is about 160 years old. I like to joke that banking is the world's second oldest profession. And it's when you think about a bank for for hundreds and hundreds of years, they've been sort of focused on two things. One is a uh, return to shareholders. So what's the value that they create to shareholders? And then how do they maintain so their shareholder license? And then how do they maintain their legislative license, their, their license to bank? I hear, I hear this all the time. Oh, if we don't do this, we're going to lose our license. Um, or we have to do this because this is part of our license. Post COVID and, and maybe, and probably way before that with the rise of fintechs, that institution of the bank as a thing you go to, as, as opposed to a thing that you do, um, has started to ha- require us to re-examine how these institutions work. And so I, I liken it to saying, look, To serve our shareholders, we've got really formed pathways through the bank. We have an entire system and infrastructure that allows us to create value for our shareholders. We have an entire system and infrastructure that allows us to create value and pass our legislative requirements. But the idea of being a purpose-led organization with a social license to bank, that's, that's new. We don't have those pathways and infrastructure in play. And this is where I find that my designers and the design human centered design approach becomes really important because we are being asked to humanize commerce and we have to build an entire infrastructure and pathway in order to serve and i liken it to going it's like we're digging another channel alongside you know the the english channel that goes to france and so we've got these high speed bulleted trains you know delivering value to shareholders and ensuring that we've got compliance and we're digging this thing out with teaspoons going we're coming you know, like when he's we're like scrabbling along and we're, you know, and, and there's opportunity, it's easy to kind of, and this is where I, whenever I hear designers sort of bemoaning that they don't have a seat at the table or that nobody appreciates design, I'm, I'm thinking about like, actually, this is the opportunity, if you flip it around to start thinking about how do you create the systems and the conditions where where design's value is extrinsic, obvious, and has the same dedication and resources and rigor as the other parts of your business. And, and it's simply because as businesses get older, they get in the habit of doing business with themselves and the value they attribute. So the business with ourselves is our legislative activity and the, and the measurement of success is the value to, to shareholders. So what does it mean if we have to create value to customers because they are questioning the institution we work in and are asking, what is your role in our lives? How do you make it better? Why does it become fair? Mm. And this is these these questions are really bubbling up right now in a post-COVID world as we re-examine a lot of the institutions that we've taken for granted over the years. Because for two years, we had to rethink our relationship with the norm. What do you feel? So when you say, okay, uh, we need to create uh, these new pathways, we need to, uh, the, the, I think you called it the social uh, license. Um, we need to implement and create an infrastructure to deliver value to customers. And w- when I say that, it sounds so silly, like how can a company exist without creating value for customers? But maybe that's that's a different conversation. Let's go <laughs> in, let's go into uh, what what do you feel is missing within the existing infrastructure? What are yeah, what's missing? I think what's missing is a obvious and shared mental model. So when we go when we see organizations that are riddled with silos, those silos become self-fulfilling. So their reward system, their value, their 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 area of influence becomes quite 
explicit and boxed in. And, and I've noticed, and I don't know if it's, it's recent or what, or this is a general thing is that even if you give people a box, they create a smaller box inside of it because they don't want to ping against the edges for fear of being, um, punished or yelled at or, or told that they don't have, or God forbid, told that they're not important and don't have value. Um, and so we create even smaller cages that we think are, are, are better. And so I, there's, there's this idea of how does, how do things connect together and how do people think both macro and micro? And that's like, that's the definition of systems thinking. And as we know, that's a learned skill and it's not, necessarily one that we kind of grow up with very quickly like I had to spend years actively thinking about systems reading and I don't think I ever went to a class around systems thinking except beyond you know what we do when we start to map so I think systems thinking as a skill um, our cultural predilection to not get in trouble or be told that we don't have value and a lack of of clear articulated services that help orient teams, um, that help orient the entire value chain towards that moment. So we're seeing a lot of rise back again of value chains where people are starting to articulate value as a, as a movement. What I'm noticing specifically that digital or digital first companies have is because they articulate that experience inside of an, a digital interface, it's a lot easier for that mental model or that shared model to be visible to everyone in the organization. And what Agile does is they break all those things up into smaller boxes and everybody works together towards that experience digitally. When you've got multi-channels, all of a sudden people are running off the reservation and everybody, you know, you've got a real capacity to scatter. The phrase I hear a lot is a spray and pray. Oh, well, they'll take care of it. We'll just hoik it over the wall to them. Or we see this, I mean, I'm, here's my, you know, power call out to all my sisters and brothers in the call centers. You know, that those are literally the drains for a lot of siloed organizations, like all it's not even like the bottom of the cliff. It's like the drain at the bottom of the cliff where all the last bits of customer problems go in. And these these, you know, these marginalized people from the organization are expected to solve all the customer problems. And this is why you see NPS completely tied to call systems. And we artificialize that with SLAs around call center times. But fundamentally, it's about. We've, we've left a lot of our, of our least represented people, least informed, least decision-making folks, you know, managing the sharp edge of our customer experience completely unconnected to the business that serves. A lot to unpack. Um, maybe we can, uh, and I'm sure that in the, the years that you've been at the bank and the, the work experience that you've gained in the years prior, you've, uh, been involved in some initiatives where you've been actively building this infrastructure, building these uh, new organizational neural pathways. Is there a project or a story or an example that comes to mind? Like, how do you, what do you actually do? How do you do this? So I, I like the framework of people process tools and you sort of tackle those towards, you have to, you have to organize those towards your intent. So the best piece of advice I ever heard, and I think it came from Jesse James Garrett, which is how often do you have an, a, a meeting with the chief experience design officer? So how often do I sit down with my role itself and articulate what's my point of view? Where are we trying? Where am I trying to take the organization and how and what are the conditions in the organization that will make that point of view will, that will make that successful? What levers can I pull what options, what experiments do I need to run? What's my certainty in terms of direction? Which sounds really highfalutin to just kind of sitting by myself with a big white piece of paper and, and scribbling things out. So my point of view is I want a single branded consistent experience, agnostic of product and channel. I've got eight major channels in our bank. Um, digital is one channel and then I've got seven human managed. So that's a lot to think about channel purpose and opti optimizing which channel customers go in and really thinking about how they all work because they all work independently of each other. So how do we create a single agnostic experience that can then be divided into the, into the optimal channels so that we can meet customer need where it is? So 
I, the, the framework is really simple, actually. Um, you need to think about your customer needs and you need to break them down into your journey territories. So, and these are, these aren't complicated. Like for like, you can search a bank's journey. I think it's like, you know, discover, apply, consider, you know, it's a, it's a path to get a home loan and every organization can do this. Like I worked for one and it was a, uh, how do I join? How do I use your services? How do I change them? How do I get help? And how do I, you know, influence? So everybody's got a set framework. And and what you do is you collate all the customer needs into those territories because they group up naturally. This comes from data, it comes from research. You know, it's pretty straightforward. Then you set your associative journey maps. Pretty simple. How does a customer solve that problem? Where are the channel touch points that those show into? But the magic is how do you connect that to your business architecture? Because the organization has its own pathway for how it solves customer need, and it's not connected to the journey pathway that our customers do. And the big aha I had was we spent years and days and months and, and decades and souls to build these complicated journey maps. And they were beautiful, big. You know, I remember meeting someone going, I have a nine foot journey map. And I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> you know, like, like we started comparing the sizes of our journey maps, which was the most like proto-masculine thing I've ever heard ever. But fundamentally, they didn't connect into the organization because the organization wasn't solving those needs, especially when you took two steps away from the customer. Customer completely disappeared. So how do you then line up your business architecture to those customer needs so that you can start understanding how does the entire organization operate to serve customers. Now, in other industries, you'll hear this as system systemic failures. Oh, that was a systemic failure of the organization. That person got hurt or that person didn't happen or we see you know, gross inequity happening over and over again. This is what they mean by systemic failure is what are all the processes in play that have to work together um, in order for the business to operate. And what we don't see enough of is how those all those processes directly tie to customer. Once you get that going, you now have the ability for the organization to view customer need. This is, and it sounds, and I want to hear more about it, but this sounds like bridging the gap between sort of the front stage journey and what happens in the backstage of the organization and connecting the goals and the needs and the desires of your customers to actually how the business operates. Huge gap for like where most journey projects fail because they aren't able to bridge that, to make that connection. Um, if you look back at uh, your journey into doing this, what were some of the, uh, I don't know, um, pivotal moments like how, how did you make this work because a lot of people stumble and fall uh, when trying to do this so we have to go back to conditions right you have to look where are the conditions of the org does the organization even see a problem right so many many years ago not so many actually now about three years ago um, you'll note in Australia that um, a lot of banks are being are watching their CEOs and chairmen of the board be exited from businesses due to fraud and not knowing what's happening in their in their banks or you know in some cases you know um, um, anti-money laundering it's basically like not knowing what's actually happening in people's organizations and so we had a similar situation and in order to meet the regulation we had to start articulating and connecting our risk to our processes and so what the organization created was a taxonomy that said, here are all the capabilities that need to be true in the bank for us to deliver a service. And what we've done is created a layered system of increasing what we would call fidelity or detail, where we break each of those levels down. And so what happens is, is we can now start to connect all of the micro tasks and activities into larger activities, into processes, into process groups, up into the capability. So all of a sudden, we got a source of truth about what the bank actually does and what it is supposed to do. When you've got really large organizations, the organization loses its power of gestalt. It starts to go, 
we are like where where you are the the sum you are the sum of your parts right you're greater than the sum of your parts a bicycle is greater than all of its parts so it all works together so really large organizations know exactly what they do in pockets but nobody knows how it all ties together because they're just looking mm -hmm. at you know return on investment or return on equity or how are we um you know what's our what's our oh you know our en employee nps and but they don't understand how those mechanisms are all working together to serve customer all of a sudden now we have the layers in play that if we connect our our front end and our back office end together to the actual infrastructure of the bank in our case we now have a line of sight from customer all the way down to micro processes and now we're putting in the data in play so that we can actually say which part of which part of the business is flaring up which part is doing really well and it allows us to focus with laser precision on what we need to improve yeah so this is like you flipped the organizational model on its head where it's driven by the customer and the customer's journey and uh, the rest of the organization is aligning around that and supporting that uh, correct correct i mean that's brilliant because it's it's we've really taken a human-centered approach to how do we as an organization serve me so what does the customer need what does the frontline person need what is the person who supports the frontline person need and so on down the line and at every level you're going what's the technology and processes that enable that person to really understand the value that they send up the chain I know for a fact that a lot of people None who are listening for <laughs> for <laughs> that a lot of people who are listening to this uh, conversation right now would dream of that situation. They are uh, working their ass off, uh, starting doing small initiatives, trying to get buy-in, trying to get support, become the champions. Um, but this doesn't sound like it was a bottom-up approach. It sounds like this was a top-down initiative to actually get this going. How did it work? Actually, it was both. So hmm. the we had the pressure of, of regulation. So we had that regulatory license lever to pull, and everyone was into that. However, because New Zealand is separate from our Australian overlords, we have, um, you know, we've been working that process from a bottom-up approach. And so what design does really, really, really well, and I think we forget that we do it really, really, really well, is that we're great at showing, not telling. We're makers, right? We take ideas in the ether and we, we reify it. We show what it looks like in real life. So what we had to do was um, A, create the frameworks. So that was our, our, what we would call our visualized experience, right? We had to create, here are the systems, here are the symptoms, here are the events. And then we had to connect it to patterns. So we were able to identify like, okay, um, we need everybody to record their work to this framework so that we can see where the work is. And now all of a sudden we're able to show the business, hey, we're all like, these are our set of prioritized initiatives. Here's all the work we're not working on anything we've said is important. How, how are we going to do that? That the organization understands, right? So then once you have that, we start to go, okay, well, what is, what is good? Like, what does good look like? Right. What, so we spent the last year on a project called visualizing reality, where we have created, you know, a, a series of major service blueprints that does connect front and back, but they're all aligned to the exact same architecture. So now we can overlay them and show patterns that are emerging in the bank to say, all of these people are working on all of these things and they're completely unaware of each other. So we start to line people up and start to break down the silos. And we just keep projects like that over and over and over again. So we looked at, um, what's a really good example? Um, oh, so we can't nail password reset for the love of God and the life behind us. Like every single time we're like, Hey, we reduced 10,000 calls in the call center. And then we'd watch them creep up again. Right. And, and we're like, why is this happening? And we had to keep going down into the pattern and the structure and the practices and the, the spaces and the interactions for that password reset. And what are the behaviors around it? And what are the values? 
And we finally figured out down at the values and mindsets area was that, um, you know, people were tweaking the ex- people were convinced that because people could reset their passwords digitally, it was somehow unsafe. And so they started to put in <laughs> blockers so that it would force people to call actually call the call center because that was how they felt they could actually authenticate a real person. And so now, instead of us talking about password reset, we're having a conversation with the organization about whose responsibility is it to validate identity? Is it the customer's responsibility to validate their identity with us? Or is it our responsibility to recognize our customers and, and, and serve them that way? And this is literally like making people's brains like leak out of their ears. But it's, you know, that's fundamentally the question. That's, uh, it seems, and I, I, I know it is, like it must be a ton of work to map this whole ecosystem. It's taken us I, a year. Well, that's amazing. Like that, <laughs> just a year. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's a year something that doesn't change, right? We think of the ecosystems as constantly shifting, right? Emergent patterns, convergent patterns, This is why having a taxonomy around your capability architecture is so important. So if you're wondering where to start, my advice is, what is it that, what are the capabilities that you provide to the organization and where do they go? Get really super clear on that and then start going, what are all the capabilities that have to be true for us to serve a customer? And then what are all the enabling capabilities that have to be true to serve for you to serve for other people to serve you to serve your customer. So think about like the value chain that it takes for you to put a product in market, right? You're going to have to um, come up with a strategy and then you think about how you design and develop it. And then, you know, how are you going to optimize that across your channels? How are you going to, you know, market it? How are people going to apply for it? How are people going to use it? And how are you going to service it? Right. And then you think about, and then everyone's really good at this. They're like, well, we need a technology department and a legal department and an HR department. And all those are true, but they're not part of that core service. They're part of enabling those people to serve. So already now you've got two divisions. You've got what needs to be true to serve it and what needs to be true to enable it. Once you get that map running, that becomes a single source of truth because those capabilities don't change. So you can actually shift all the conditions around it because that always stays the same. And that gives you a lot of scale and speed. Now, one of the things uh, that I see happening a lot is uh, visualizing is great, mapping is great, uh, sort of uh, creating overview, making sense of the chaos is great. Um, And everybody nods their head and uh, sort of applauds you for doing that. But the moment that map or the journey or that visualization starts to imply that somebody needs to start doing something else or somebody might lose their job or move to a different team like uh people start tearing down the walls and removing your uh, journey maps how did they how did this work out on on your end yeah i actually had uh post a, a different company but after after a restructure where actually a lot of um, I lost my role, uh, apparently a whole bunch of people in a p- peak of fury ripped the journey map down as a form of protest. And I was like, yeah, um, sorry, I got distracted by that call. Could you that story? Could you ask it? One well, uh, I can rephrase it quite simply. How do you go from overview to actually changing tangible things, people, processes? Um, Absolutely. Um, so the thing that's worked really well for us is what, now that we have our frameworks in play, we sent a survey out to our frontline teams, uh, specifically in our case, our bankers. And in that survey, we asked them like, what's working really well. We, it was a 10 minute survey with a series of questions. And we wanted to know what across the journey did, were they perceiving that worked well or didn't work well. And that had a huge response. And what we were able to now show is as as a really specific view. We had the frontline perception of the current experience mapped to the journey territories. And because we have all the work in the organization mapped to that, we're able to say, okay, if this is the area that you're unhappy with, here's the 27 JIRA tickets that have 
self-identified as working in that space. So we're able then to pull the 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 bank the front of the, the bank that serves customers and the bank that and the part of the bank that builds those services that people have to sell. And we started a conversation going, all right, is this making any hey penny difference to this? Does this piece of work make any difference to that? Does this piece of work? And they're able to start understanding how it all pieces together to then discern if there's going to be any value for them, their shareholders and our social license and our legal license. More importantly, we were able to understand, we were able to see the number of pieces of work, were they lined up to the areas where the bank itself felt it like it had the most problems? And unsurprisingly, we found that it didn't. So when you think about the, um, the Forrester framework for excellent customer experience, there's six areas. One area is design, another is, another is customer understanding, another is measurement, and they've added one called prioritization. The challenge with the bank and the whole point of this experience infrastructure is how do we prioritize work with the same rigor and intent to customer as we do to shareholder and, and legal license facts. And so now this gives us a pathway with evidence to say, this is what's most important. We don't actually have priority on this. Let's start building a program to it. Mm. And we break it down smaller and smaller pieces because we've got the layers of the taxonomy finite and articulated. Is this, uh, have you seen that having this structure and this evidence is the thing that convinces um, senior leaders to actually make the investment? Yeah, so this is what's really, so this is, that's the bottom-up approach. Top-down, we had a, a legislative push. Um, we finally had a moment where the shareholder value wasn't being perceived as well. And we had an entirely new leadership team come in and realize that our right to growth as an organization is based on how well we meet customer need. So magically, we now have an organization that wants to be purpose-led, that wants to invest in social life. Nobody knows how to do that because all they use is NPS as the only human value at that level. So what this infrastructure gives them is a series of measures and stories that can connect at, at any level of the, at any detail of level of the organization, what is actually happening to provide confidence and certainty that we're moving towards that ambition of mm. serving our customers in a way that, that uh, enables both their future and ours. So it sounds like you were almost in a perfect yeah. storm where there was so much pull and there was so much push to get this oh going. Exactly. I'm uh, curious, weren't you, weren't you, <laughs> conditions? Yeah, well, uh, they don't align uh, in this way that often. Mm -hmm. I mean, weren't you or uh, worried? Uh, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I'm curious to hear about that. But first, weren't you worried that you would uh, stumble and sort of fumble the ball now? <laughs> Like this is a golden ticket to to start implementing this. Yeah, maybe a handful of people have this opportunity and where all these conditions align. I regularly have to lie under tables and make carpet angels to convince myself that I'm not gonna fuck the whole thing up. So yeah. And and then and you know, this is where you know you start, you know, embracing your authentic self and realize actually I am gonna fuck the whole thing up daily, minute by minute, hour by hour, month by month life by life. Um, and, um, you know, this is where this is, and, and, and this is where you also realize like, this is not, it's not, a, it's not about me and it never has been. So, you know, it's fundamentally about how, who are the, who are the people in your world that are, are, are creating this magic with uh, for you and with you. I mean, remember, design thinking is not only who you design for, but who you design with. And so, yeah, I'm constantly getting in the way of my team because, you know, I'm an overexcited puppy. Um, I, I regularly have my exec team going, you don't make any sense to us. And, you know, that's a, that's a lesson. Um, and, you know, constantly uh, a thousand hours of conversations. Um, and so it's, it's just, it's, it's not, a, it's not about whether I, I, I make it successful or I don't make it successful. What it actually is, is, is having the genuine belief and the genuine 
energy to connect with people and make it part of a of a of a self-fulfilling movement of service it's it's literally like being a waitress to go back to the beginning of this conversation you know we're going hey this is this great restaurant i'm going to make sure that your experience with me is as awesome as it is and so even if i don't make sense and even if i throw up you know throw literally throw up or throw a ball you know we we still have the relationship and the and the connection that says yeah i i i want to do this too let's let's go um i think i think often that every you know what we do really well as design is collaborate and co-create co and if we if i keep that in the wheelhouse at the front at all times then all the machinations and all of my like mr burns plotting and and all of the all of the picture that we're trying to create gets a little bit more real every single day. Yeah. Uh, giving it your best shot. That's the best thing you can do. Oh. And, and uh, to get fired yeah. today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so survived another day. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's, that's, uh, that's the only attitude you can have. Yeah, um, I highly recommend, you know, mild, you know, medical, medical support. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, looking back at your experience, uh, what were some of the, I don't know, uh, initiatives, actions, things you did or were part of that in hindsight had a disproportional positive effect in actually making this a reality it's all about trust and and it's actually about trust at single layer of that experience infrastructure we have to create trust with our customers bankers have to trust the bank that they're going to support them to build trust with their customers uh people inside the bank have to build trust with their colleagues in order to drive those services up like it's all about trust and so when i came into the organization you know a few several uh several years ago the condition like the conditions still baffle me. Um, you know, we had no tools. They were the tools we had were independently purchased with credit cards, which was um, a legislative taboo, and I had to fix that for the for the official license. Um, you know, everyone was decentralized without a core model, um, and everyone was running around going, "What service design? Why am I a service designer now? Who, what do they do? Why am I here?" <laughs> like, um, so. From a people process tool standpoint, we were we were below even we were so far away, and and I remember um, wanting to talk to customers um, in that first year, and go and and having to convince the bank to trust us to talk to customers, and they're like, oh no, you can't talk to customers, you are, you don't know what you're talking about, you're not a banker, and I'm like, that's true, I'm not actually talking to them about their banking options, I want to talk to them about the relationship with the bank and how do they view your solution? No, 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 we don't trust you to talk to customers. And it took me about a hundred hours of intense conversation with anyone who would talk to me, which uh, wasn't many, um, to convince them to let us talk to customers. And so they finally gave us like six customers that they thought we wouldn't mess up the relationship with. They're like, eh, this relationship with these customers is so in the toilet. There's nothing you're going to do that's going to make it worse. And I'm like, Thank you very much. We'll take it. <laughs> so six customers after a hundred hours of negotiation. Um, and, and we did what design does really well. We, we asked really great questions. We wanted to understand their experience. We wanted to understand their experience with the bank. We wanted to understand what are the style of those services look like and how do they help? And we came back with, here's why the relationship with us is so crappy. It's because this, 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 and this. And if we fix these things, they're going to be thrilled. And I guarantee you we've got more people like this. And by the way, that service you think is awesome that you're just about to invest like, you know, $20 million in, eh, they're not super into it. Can we maybe rethink this? Four years later, and, and that, what that allowed us, that built us trust because they had no idea that that was the reason that the relationship was squiffy. And so they started to, so they said, okay, well, those are the, like how you're talking to the customers we don't care about. Maybe we'll have some customers that we would like to have a better relationship with, but we're not going to really invest a lot of time into. So why don't you talk to them? And so we just started showing what would happen when you started talking to humans 
about the thing as opposed to talking to humans about, you know, about the thing itself. And so four years later, we, I now have a customer care lab where we demonstrate care to customers in a transparent and safe space that allows people to be curious and, and to sit outside of any advice statement where we test policies, prototypes, service, and offerings in as real a situation as we can artificially create. So we've got a little fake branch in our, in our area. And, and it's amazing still, like engineers come into the lab and they look at this box that we have for our, our bankers and they go, where's the second screen? And you're like, there isn't one. They're like, no, no, everyone has two screens. That's how it works. And I said, I know. How does that work when we're building things that you have to drag and drop across applications when there's only one screen and it's this big? <laughs> and they're going, well, this is never going to work. I'm like, I know. What are we going to do? So like, like there's this situational reality that people completely forget about, even when it's down to the screen. A really great example of this also working around creating empathy for each other, our customers and the people who serve them. We, we have a wonderful initiative where we are granting identity to, custom, to uh, foster kids and prisoners through their bank accounts. And I'm really proud of this. I, I didn't even, it's not even my project. It's by this other one who's just magnificent, our, our extra care team. And prisoners come out of, uh, out of the, the, the prison system and it, they struggle to um, find a place to live and get a job because they don't have a bank account. And the reason they don't have bank accounts is they don't have any documentation that, that shows you exist. So we're now banking these people. Um, we're giving accounts to these people, which actually gives them identity. So when you look at foster kids, a lot of them are neurodiverse. They've been through the ringer. There's a, there's a lack of trust there. And so when they were building out how we were going to um, get them ready for bank accounts, we were thinking they'd come into the branches and then they'd go into these little taupe rooms with these desks and this single screen. And they'd sit there for two hours while we lectured them about financial responsibility and, and get them through the space. I brought the lawyers and the team in and I shoved them all in this box and I said, you're not allowed out for two hours. They lasted 20 seconds. They're like, we have to go to them. We have to create a mobile service. I mean, that's 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 what we get when we start to to show and not tell what experiences are like. And is that uh, sort of the summary to the answer or to the question, what had a disproportional effect? Show, show and don't, don't tell. tell. We got there eventually. <laughs> mm. Mm. Uh, I think that's the thing that sort of resonates through the story that uh, you build trust by showing people uh I don't know if the evidence is the right Experience. word, but uh, getting yeah, and letting them uh, or making them part of the experience. 100%. Yeah. yeah. So it's not about telling them what to do or making them feel unvalued or redesigning their job. It's going, here's the experience. How can we make this better? Yeah. Yeah. And, and finding ways to invite them into that yeah. experience. Yeah. Uh, we are heading sort of, sort of towards uh, the wrap up of our conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm, dying to know what's next you've already had an amazing ride what's next we have to get the death star operational so you know we've <laughs> we've we've built all the stuff and now we are turning it on at scale so um we we're we fundamentally have to change the way our customers perceive us and we have to create value more efficiently and now we've got to do it um, across 5,000 people as opposed to the pockets of, of work that we're doing. But I'm, I'm excited for this next stage because this is where the rubber hits the road and the practice becomes embedded. That's uh, exciting times. Stay um, tuned. If, <laughs> yeah, stay tuned. We'll do a sequel, part two, uh, in works. six months or something <laughs> like that. Uh, or maybe I'll, maybe I'll give you a bit more. Um, if somebody made it all the way uh, to this moment with us into the conversation, what's the one thing you hope that they will remember uh, in a year or time from our chat here? You can't build change on shifting sands. You have to get to the bedrock, that core foundation of, of your organization, whatever it may be. And you have to look at square in the eye with clear eyes and an open heart. And on that note, I want to thank you 
Baron. Uh, this isn't a goodbye. <laughs> this is a, uh, this is a more or less a see you soon, hopefully, uh, to hear more how your journey uh, is going. Um, thanks again for coming on uh, early in the morning and uh, sharing your story with uh, us. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, it. Katoa, we're, I'm so, it's been a really fast and lovely moment for me. So thank you. I hope that you enjoyed the conversation with Perrin just as much as I did. After the official recording ended, we kept on chatting for quite a while. If you could ask Perrin one question about the things we've just discussed, what would it be? Leave a comment down below and we'll try to answer all of your questions. If you've made it all the way here and enjoyed this conversation, please do me a quick favor. Click the like button on this video. This lets me know whether or not you're enjoying discussing topics like this and if we should address them more often. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for spending a small part of your day with me. It's an absolute honor and pleasure. Please keep making a positive impact on the people around you. And I look forward to seeing you on the next video. See you soon.